production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckets join me shortly in our topics this week. <clears throat> what's happening with Kansas Republicans? And what about guns on campus? And what's a week without a demonstration? Plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and look at a city that rarely generates controversy and therefore is rarely discussed on Ruckus. The city is Westwood, a small, mostly white community of about 1,500 in Johnson County, not far west of the Country Club Plaza. Until recently, the city has primarily contained single-family homes. But a new apartment and retail complex at 47th and Rainbow, with a second phase on the way, has generated debate about future development plans, tax increment financing, and what kind of a city Westwood residents want. Here to talk about all that and probably more is attorney Jim Orr, who previously served as Westwood City Attorney. Jim, welcome to Ruckus. Good to see you. Thank you for coming in. You bet. Good to be here. Let's uh, get what side you're on. You're with a recently formed neighborhood association that's not really happy about what's going on. Is that fair to say? That's that's exactly right. I'm I'm here representing no one. I'm here on my own behalf, but I am part of that uh, part of that group. Yes. And you were once the Westwood City Attorney. I was. Yes. Uh, when did you leave that job? Oh, gosh, uh, that's a pop quiz. Well, I a guess the, the, the real question <laughs> is, were you involved as city attorney when this development uh, phase began? No, I was not. Okay. No. Uh, I drove around Westwood the other day, mm -hmm. as I often do. I, I like to go in that area a lot nearby. And I looked for the signs that I knew existed. And I found one. I think we showed it on our introduction mm -hmm. to the piece. And if I jotted my notes down correctly, it says, single family only, no medium density. That's right, Mike. Well, uh, what does that mean? Well, what's the point? Well, uh, part of the concern about this development is that it's inconsistent with the, the history and, and the makeup of the city of Westwood. Westwood's been an overwhelmingly single-family residential community since, since before its incorporation, in fact. That's, uh, that's reflected not only the obvious demographics, but in the, the wishes of the citizens through comprehensive planning processes, and most recently through the yard sign campaign. Uh, what this project uh, does is injects uh, uh, a wholly unusual and risky uh, element into the city. It's inconsistent with the way the city uh, fabric operates right now. It's potentially damaging or certainly not supportive of the keynote of the city, which is its support for public education and its local grade school. And then there are a lot of risks and concerns well, inherent in this kind of project. How is it risky? Well, I mean, how does it affect the school system? How it affects the school system? Yeah. A couple of ways. Uh, first of all, you've got 330 apartments, very high-end apartments, $2,500 a month for a right. two-bedroom apartment. That changes the demographics of the city, or at least certainly doesn't add to the demographics that will support a grade school. Westwood View Grade School has an outsized uh, impact or, uh, upon the city. It's really part and parcel of the city's identity, its brand. And, and so you're not bringing in people that are likely to have kids that will populate the school. More importantly, in my judgment, because of the use of, of tax, uh, tax incentives, TIF in particular, you erode the, uh, uh, the financial support for the city. Well, if there's such disdain for this plan, how did it come into existence? Well, the... Uh, uh, the and was there a public vote? Was this an no, action no, no, by no, the city not, council? It's, it's action by the city council. Was it not part of the city's master plan? Well, the city's master plan, no, <laughs> I think would be a short answer. There are a number of... Is there a city master plan? Yes, there is. Plan? Yeah, there is. Uh, uh, and and that's, a, that's a little bit of a trick question. Uh, the city's master plan had not been changed in many, many years. It had been looked at but not changed. And after this was underway, the city went back and uh, has engaged in a comprehensive plan review. So it's a little bit cart before the horse. Okay. It, well, what do you and those who think like you do want done? Well, what we would like to do is uh, uh, see projects like this analyzed with a lot more critical thought. For example, for example, it's fine. It's fine to criticize Governor Brownback for having cockamamie economic plans that erode public education. 
But then you've got to look at the cockamamie economic plans of the city of Westwood that erode public education and say, we shouldn't be doing TIF in a little community like this. We should be making sure that any development creates tax dollars that go to our school. And uh, you have fear, I think, about what this might do to the value of your homes? Uh, that's not a personal concern uh, for me. I'm more concerned about uh, the fact that you're adding three to five hundred, well, more than three to five hundred. It's a 330 unit par apartment complex, so four to five hundred adults in a city that only has 1,100 uh, adults. This is helped by tax increment financing, is it not? It's got the whole alphabet soup, Mike. It's got tax increment financing, it's got CID, it's got IRB, industrial revenue bond mm -hmm. financing, and the city's even giving land. Uh, to the developer. And very quickly, there's a second phase to this development. What is it? The second phase is more mixed use in apartments, a uh, substantial number of apartments, I think 240 some. Here's the problem. That second phase missed its cost projections by 79%. That second phase is likely to cost 16, 17 million dollars more than they predicted. And they're already about a year late on this project. So what's scary? The city's got a lot of money in this. They're missing deadlines, they're missing cost projections, they're now asking for more tax money to support them. And my concern is this is going to become, maybe already has become, those scary words, too big to fail. Okay, we'll continue to watch it. Perhaps we can get you to come back in a few months and let us know how things have developed. Hope so. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. All right, that is attorney Jim Orr of Westwood. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Steve Glorioso is a media and political consultant. Laura McConwell is in private legal practice and is a former three-term mayor of Mission, Kansas. Jamika Kendricks is an education activist, and Woody Kozad is president of the Kozad Company, a government relations firm. Welcome to all of you, and thanks for coming in. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Demonstrators turned up at KCI and in other large city airports across the country last weekend in angry reaction to a temporary ban on immigrant migrants and refugees from seven Muslim-majority countries. The order, imposed by the Trump administration, is part of the continuing war against terrorism. Critics call the executive order a Muslim ban, but according to the White House, that's inaccurate because at least 40 other Muslim-majority nations are not included. Presumably, the fate of the ban will ultimately be determined by the courts. During the protest in Los Angeles, some demonstrators chanted, No Trump, no KKK, no fascist USA. Well, now that we've had a few days to think about all of this, two questions persist. Steve, we'll yes. start with you. Was the order justified and were the demonstrations justified? The order is an embarrassment to the heritage of the United States of America. Um, for over a century, the entire world knew the United States was represented by the words on the Statue of Liberty, which most people don't read the last line, but give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free, that wretched refuge, which means refugees of your teeming shores, send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me, I lift my yeah, we've all heard that, we, we know, war. but, that wasn't, but the, that wasn't on the Statue of Liberty when it was arriving in the United States. I understand. That was it, added it, years later. Well, yeah. it, well, what difference does that make, Mike? Well, the because the is, purpose is that of that it originally what, was not to welcome refugees. It uh, was to salute liberty in the United okay, States. But that's what its meaning became when they added that, which was from a poem. But the point of it is, is that we've always been a welcoming country, and this is just they can call it what they want, but it's, but it represents, you let me answer, this is, it represents yes, if you a will. philosophy in the White House by Steve Bannon, where he has been quoted for years saying we ought to stop all immigration, we shouldn't take refugees, it's anti-American, and Trump is an anti So the order was not justified, in your opinion, no, but absolutely the demonstrations, not. were they justified? Absolutely they were justified. It was Americans standing up for our principle, and the last time I looked, except for the first Americans, that being the natives, uh, we're all refugees. You know, my, my grandparents, they tried to stop them from coming, too, because they were papists. And this is just so did, wrong, whether you we can parse religious. it just if you Just before we go to Woody, uh, did you see the word temporary in all of this? It doesn't matter. It's the symbol. 
that it is. They know what they're doing. This is okay. the beginning of a philosophy that Trump well, and Bannon have to change the character of the United okay, States. Okay, now we're going to turn to Woody. Uh, yes. Was the order justified and were the demonstrations justified? Uh, the order's justified because the FBI said while President Obama was still in office that they were unable to vet these people properly to find out if somebody was coming here who'd been training in an ISIS a terrorist camp. Uh, and so what are you going to do about that? Well, first of all, these same seven countries were picked out by the Obama right. administration for special treatment on travel to the United States. So this is just an expansion, a temporary expansion, uh, completely legal under the statutes, uh, for the president to do this. And so he picked these seven countries, the same ones that President Obama picked and nobody said anything, and expanded that for 90 days to, to this ban. And the result of it is supposed to be at the end of it, we're able to vet people properly coming from those countries. Critics keep calling this a ban on religion and religious tests. Do you see it as that, Laura? Yeah. It, you know, my, I, I can't say yes or no, but I will tell you that my concern about listening to these arguments is some of the people that are unhappy about the about having a ban, and I, I, I do appreciate Steve's point of view that we don't want to send a message that ISIS can use against us, but I also appreciate that we, that the citizens of the United States want the federal government to keep them safe. And if they, the government doesn't take steps to try to do more intensive screening and more bad things happen, like 9-11, they're going to be unhappy that we didn't keep us safe. And so I don't know if it's a conundrum. Um, your other question was, is do people have a right to protest? Oh, Absolutely, they have, right. they have a right to protest. Well, you know, well, one good saving factor about this, well, actually, it actually added to the chaos. Uh, David Brooks, a well-respected no. moderate conservative columnist, said <laughs> about this. Pardon me. <laughs> uh, you, Not everybody thinks he's a well, conservative. Well, I understand, and you know, Woody moderate. misrepresented the Obama situation <laughs> terribly. He, 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 Obama we didn't ban on, anyone. Yeah. To say that it is an amateur hour at the White House is a slander well, amateur. I want to say, so they bungled issue, it. I want to ask you a question, Jamika. If you live in one of these seven countries and you're not a Muslim, can you come into the United States? During these 120 days or 90 days, I'm assuming days? because the countries are have, are banned, then no, you cannot. Okay, so it's not a ban exclusively mm -hmm. on people who are Muslims. No, but it is on Muslim countries. But I think the issue here is not necessarily the ban. I think the issue is that the ban was implemented at a time when we were at had such divisiveness in our country, and people are not understanding what's going on. And I think people are just looking at this is my party, this is what we believe, and so I'm fighting against it. I think if Trump had waited, knowing that we were in the uh, state that we were in, and actually done this in a different way, it might not have. Um, warranted all of the different things that are going on right now. And if he had waited, if there had been a massive attack on the country, there then he been. would have been blamed. Oh, always use scare Come on, tactics. Mike. But well, you don't know. The 19 don't... people that did 9-11 are from Saudi Arabia. Did you see yeah. them on the list? No, and he's got a hotel in Saudi Arabia. 19 people are dead, Mike, uh, Steve. Steve they're dead. I, and there none, are none of them six came six from these countries. Six, six of these go. seven countries do not actually have a government that controls their territory. The only exception to that is Iran. And so the, these aren't really governments, in a sense, of all their territory. They have no control. We can't go negotiate with them as we could with, say, Saudi Arabia, because they don't control their country. We have to move well, on to something far less controversial. Oh, God. <laughs> guns. Do we ever do, do, that? do, do, do guns? <laughs> do guns yeah, on let's a, lower the temperature. Do guns on a college campus make the environment safer or more dangerous? As I expect we will soon see and hear, opinions are hardly unanimous. The issue is front and center in Kansas, where if the law is not changed by July, Kansas colleges and universities must allow concealed carry on campus. Those who want the law changed say administrators, faculties, and students are generally worried and fearful. Those who support the current law point out that anyone in Kansas who is qualified to carry a concealed weapon, and that's almost anyone over 21 in Kansas, can carry virtually anywhere. So why should campuses be the exception? And that is our first question, and we'll direct it to Jamika. Um, I think any place where young people, in colleges I consider young people, even though that makes me sound really old, I know. 
Um, <laughs> Welcome but to these the are, these yeah. are folks yeah. who are, you You're know, not alone. <laughs> when they get there, most of them are 17, 18 years old. These are teenagers. And then they turn 21, and that's like, you know, go out and drink and have a good time, lose your mind, because it's college. And I think um, the students are not there feeling like I'm unprotected. I need some kind of protection. I, there wasn't... I don't know of any students who actually went down and said, hey, can we get a law where there's concealed carry on our campus? It was not an issue. I think politicians have made it an issue. I don't know why. And so I would like for universities to actually have a choice. We, uh, we wouldn't say nonprofits are required to have this thing happen. And so I think universities and campuses should have the same kind of choices that we give to businesses when we implement laws like this. What do you think, Laura? Do you think colleges or campuses are different than anywhere else in Kansas? Well, I, I, with guns, I mean, it used to be in Kansas anyway, I mean, people had guns in their dorm room, and I don't know at what point it changed that they didn't allow guns, but I do know the way that people are seem to be shoot first and ask questions later, um, and with the sort of the mixing of students, I think universities should have the opportunity to say no guns. It's sort of like when the state said that local government had to allow guns, concealed weapons coming into, you know, City Hall and our pools and every place else unless we put up metal detectors, which is really cost prohibitive for, yeah. for folks to have. And, yeah, so and, I... And, and that's a good point, Steve. You, you can ban guns on campuses if you have sufficient metal detectors. If no yeah. one can bring in a gun, then then that's fine. But uh, if you don't yeah, have the metal detectors... Kind of impractical detector, in, in a well, campus I don't know. with, with yeah. hundreds of acres. The, the reason they say so they can't is because of the cost involved, right? Well, and, uh, Jamika makes a good point. You, you, at least on the Missouri side, you, you see on the doors of businesses, uh, guns are prohibited. And... Uh, I don't know, again, I, I, the Kansas law may be different, but I think a, a, an organization ought to have the right to decide whether they want people walking around with, with guns and, and, and in their pockets. And not, You know, the concealed part's really a problem. Why, okay, what ha, why not have them in holsters out where you know who's got a gun? Uh, I bet I, they won't. Why don't they? I, 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 one thing, in Missouri, if you pass this law and if the Board of Curators wanted to challenge it in court, I think they'd win. Because in Missouri, what the law says is that the government of the University of Missouri system shall be vested in the Board of Curators. I don't believe they could tell the University of Missouri by law that it had to allow concealed carry. I commend to the people of Kansas, if they want to do something about this, that they simply put something like let, that. Let me ask yes. you this, Woody. What do you think the rationale for... What, what do you think the rationale for... What do you think the rationale for lawmakers was... In, in passing this, the protection of students or trying to make a point about the Second Amendment? A point. Uh, I, Sorry. Was your name Woody? <laughs> <laughs> For a second it was. At least I thought you said Jamaica. <laughs> well, they sound a lot like well, Jamaica and Woody. You can already tell the difference. <laughs> anyway, Woody. I, I, I think uh, Jamaica's right. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. Uh, uh, I think this is, you know, this goes on all the time from both parties uh, uh, dealing with their base vote. And nothing is ever enough you got to have a new bill every session of the legislature that proves your complete vassalage to whatever group in your base there is. If you don't control the legislature, you don't file those bills and you look reasonable. But you're not. If you were in control, you'd be doing the same thing for your groups. But in any event, that's what they, they're just, they do just set out to make a point. Now, let me say, we've had a couple campus incidents, and you can always make the argument, if somebody had been in that room yep. who had a gun, who was a lawful citizen, he might have stopped the carnage or reduced it. And I believe that. We've got to wrap it, it up. If somebody uh, had been in a room uh, with a gun, it would have, have escalated to, further. have to wrap it up. I mean, Sorry. people who want to... <laughs> do violence, commit damage, hurt people, are not stopped by laws that ban that sort of activity. Anyway, if you thought Kansas Congresswoman Lynn Jenkins was the presumptive Kansas GOP gubernatorial nominee in 2018, you might want to think again. Jenkins announced last week that she would not seek re-election to the House next year and, in fact, would run for nothing in 2018. Before going to D.C., Jenkins was active in state politics, winning election as the state treasurer and serving in both the state house and senate. So what happens now in Kansas GOP circles? What Republicans might run for governor? Who better to ask than a Kansas Republican who has herself run successfully for public office? So, Mayor, who are some of the folks we may see in this Republican race? Well, I think that... 
low-hanging fruit, so to speak. Uh, you've got our lieutenant governor, Jeff Collier, who hasn't said whether he's intending to run for governor or not, but he is um, someone that is out and about and doing a lot of appearances and things for the governor. You've got Derek Schmidt, who's our attorney general, mm -hmm. who's, you know, also very well respected, and he's been in the state legislature, and he's been a staffer for some of our, for what, for a congressman um, or woman. And then we've got um, Chris Kobach, who is our uh, secretary of state, um, it's been talked about him maybe going to, it, both things have been talked about with him, and obviously they're not, I'm not the one they're going to call and tell, but he's somebody else. Um, Ed O'Malley, who is actually my former state legislator mm -hmm. in Mission, uh, he was now the head of the Kansas Leadership Center, which is in, funded by Community Health Money, who lives in Wichita, ha is doing an exploratory campaign. And there are more people that are, I think, out kicking tires. and. I think it'll, there will be more with Lynn indicating she's not going to run. Are you surprised she's not running? Uh, For anything. Well, yeah, I, yes and no. I mean, I don't know that the average person understands the uh, personal toll it takes to be an elected official and to be, um, to be a public servant. And Lynn has been doing it now for 20 years. She did it 10 years on the state level, and now she's been 10 years in Congress. Yeah. And it's it is extremely tolling. And she, you know, her children are now older, and she did this while she was mm. raising raising children. Um, it's extremely mm. expensive to try to live two places. Mm. And so, but no, then again, I, nobody forced her to run for office. No one was, forced her to run for office, but she's done a. Which is a, why she can quit. She's, yeah. exactly. That's right. Uh, uh, she probably the person who gains the most attention whenever the future of Kansas politics is talked about is Chris Kobach, the Secretary of State. And we thought for a while he was going to Washington, and apparently General Kelly at HHS said, uh, not HHS, uh, Department of Homeland Security, said he was not acceptable for the number two post, which had been offered to him, apparently, by President Trump, at least according to the Wall Street Journal. Kobach was on ruckus uh, six, eight months ago, and we talked about the prospect of him running for governor. I haven't made any decision. I'm looking seriously at it. Uh, got a long, you know, we're still two and a half years away from the 2018 election, but uh, have not made any decision. What do you think about uh, Kobach, Woody? If he were to run, we know he's criticized a lot because of his position on immigration issues and vote fraud. But yet he wins elections and seems to win them rather handily. Well, I think he's, look, if Kobach runs for governor, he's a formidable candidate and would be tough to beat. I've also, I wanted to say, heard rumors, and they're worth exactly what you're about to pay me for them, uh, accuracy. I may be committing fake news here, uh, that, that both the Attorney General and uh, the Secretary of State are looking at Lynn Jenkins' seat mm -hmm. in Congress as a possible uh, move to make. And since the laws of residency in those matters are non-existent, mm -hmm. uh, all they've got to do is file and, and rent an apartment in the congressional district and they can run. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's that, true or not, but I'm passing that along. Yeah, I've, I've, I have heard that as well. Musical They're both chairs. in the second district. Yep. <laughs> uh, so Steve, has the Democratic Party's chances in Kansas in 2018 improved because of what's happened with the Brownback administration? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yes. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's, it says something a lot about Chris Kobach that he's so radical he can't even fit in the Trump administration. Now that may change overnight, but you mentioned uh, one of the more respected people that, that Trump appointed not wanting him. But I, you know, the, Kansas does elect Democrats. Uh, obviously, okay. Sebelius, uh, Carlin, uh, Joan even, even what was her name? The, Joan Finney. Yeah, that was embarrassing, <laughs> but she won. And I think this will be a good, a good shot. Paul well, Davis came close in yeah. uh, uh, against an incumbent, and if we could get a good candidate, or if they can well, get a good candidate, they can win. Paul Davis is probably interested in running again. They might be. All right, uh, we're going to have to head to the soapbox for roast and toast, where the Ruckettes have 30 seconds each to uphold or scold people and events in the news. And we start with Laura. Well, I'm going to, uh, I've been debating this all week, but I'm actually going to toast Johnson County 3 and 2 Baseball Club. Uh, they have 29, it's a not-for-profit that has 29 baseball fields in Johnson County, and they are the uh, complex of the year for 2016 by USSA. They have thousands of young men and some young women who go through that they help have fun family times all through the summer and help 
help their, their with their character development. And I think we need to champion our not-for-profits doing great things for our community. All right, Woody. Um, I'd like to toast my now late friend, Charles Sharp, who died yesterday. Charlie was a high school graduate from a not very good high school in, in the rural part of Northeast Missouri. He founded Ozark National Life Insurance Company, uh, single-handedly built it up into what it is today, and then gave away about $100 million, most of which wasn't even deductible, uh, to build a community to help people rebuild their lives who are addicted to drugs or alcohol or abused children. Uh, and he will be a great loss to the state of Missouri. Steve. And he was a good guy, yeah. a good person. I want to roast the dishonest bums in the media. <laughs> I uh, Actually, tongue in cheek, I'd like to roast Steve Kraske and by extension Mike <laughs> Shannon. Kraske, a most respected star reporter, said on Week in Review the week before last that all three of the April 4th city bond issues have to pass for any of them to take effect. That's not true. All three stand on their own, but it is a well-constructed package, uh, and all three should pass. And then Mr. Shannon heard, I presume, Mr. Kraske say it, and he raised the question on ruckus. So the truth of the matter is, is that they stand on their own. It, it doesn't mean that if one fails, they all fail. Well, they shouldn't be separated on the ballot, so people would know that. Uh, Jamika. <laughs> Um, I'm being personal today, so uh, I want to give a shout out, because I promised I would, to the students I'm working with at Symington Elementary School in Hickman Mills. They are in the sixth grade, and it's Mr. Walker's class, so shout out to you all. And I want to give a toast to the man who has supported me in doing all of the advocacy work that I've done over the years. I would not have been able to do it without him, and his birthday is February 9th. Um, that is my husband, Jermaine Kendrick, so I wanted to give a toast to him. And for those of you eager to hear my roast or toast, tune in next week because we're out of time now. Aww. That is Ruckus this time. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckus and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.